From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And welcome once again. Thanks for coming back to episode number 30 of the Cannabis Podcast. If this is your first visit, well, thanks for dropping by. I've got a ton of information about cannabis. This is a time where it is absolutely fabulous to be a Canadian. We are almost to a year. In fact, it is one day from the day or one week from the day I'm recording this when legalization will have hit its one year mark. Cannabis has been legalized in our country for almost one year. One of the topics we're going to talk about today, let's take a look back. This is from an article on theconversation.com, the state of legalization ahead of the election, which is, of course, coming up October 21st. Who knows what will happen in that? And we're not going to talk a whole lot about politics on the Cannabis Podcast. We're too busy smoking a joint. Don't have time to talk politics. The big news over this last little while, if you have been paying any attention, and if you ever drop on leafly.com or leafly.ca, is that similar to a discussion we have been having on the Cannabis Podcast since day one, is that maybe it's time to drop indica and sativa as being our definitions of the cannabis we're looking for. Leafly has come out with a brand new cannabis guide, really quite a stretch from what we're currently doing. As many others have done, there's some re-education we have to do in order to quite understand it, but it's interesting. So we will take at the new cannabis definition guide on Leafly. That's another item that we will cover off. And the big news, it is harvest time. I have gone along with my four plants. They have reached the harvest stage, and we're going to touch about all that and a whole lot more. All of that is coming your way on episode number 30 of the Cannabis Podcast. So let's stop at leafly.ca first of all. Now, I'm assuming that this is the same on leafly.com. I did not check it out for myself. I could be wrong. So you can check out leafly.ca as usual. Everything I'm talking about in this episode, I have posted a link back on cannabispodcast.com. That's where you'll find it. And that's where you'll find the link to this information on leafly.ca. Before I carry on much further, also let me apologize for the state of my voice today. I have a bit of a cold. In case it's not obvious, it's so obvious to me. And hopefully it's not too annoying for you. When we get on to the leafly.ca site, and we they have a really interesting video, and obviously I'm not going to walk through all of those pieces because you can look at that yourself. After the initial introduction, when you drop onto leafly.ca, there's a follow-up video that I've actually found quite humorous. It kind of lays out the problem we have with people trying to identify what their cannabis is. So what's the big deal? What has Leafly done? Instead of looking at indicas or sativas, they are proposing that we look at rather the cannabinoids that are making up those particular strains. And they've gone a step further now, and they are associating shapes to each of the cannabinoids. Now, the cannabinoids we're talking about, of course, in cannabis are the two primary ones, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and CBD, cannabidiol. Leafly has decided in their infinite research, and it looks like they put a ton of research into this, so I'm really glad that people are now having that opportunity to research this to a fuller extent. This is the end result. Their decision, that the shapes they have chosen is a diamond for THC and a circle for CBD. So as you look at the various strains on the Leafly site, you'll find that they are represented by a number of these objects, diamonds and circles. If the center of that particular strain is a diamond, that means it's THC dominant. If the center of that particular strain is a circle, it's CBD dominant. And taking that one step further, if the diamond or circle is elongated, it means there is more higher values of either THC or CBD, depending which shape you're talking about. So a really interesting way to start the classification. The first step as they have outlined in their new classification guide, is find a shape. So are you interested in a CBD dominant or a THC dominant? Or perhaps you're looking for one that has a few circles and a few diamonds around their circle of representation. That's the first piece. So once we have found the shape, now we're going to find the color. And here's the interesting part that really dips into what we've been talking about on the Cannabis Podcast since day one and have many in the cannabis industry, and that's terpenes. We are all learning more and more and understanding more and more about the importance of terpenes 
and how the terpenes are, in fact, what's providing our flavor, our, our aroma, our smell, and we're realizing as well the effect of that particular cannabis and, and the entourage effect of that combination of terpenes. So in that regard, Leafly has said, choose a color. Now, here's where we still have some learning to do because it's not intuitive for me to think of linalool as a dark purple. It's not intuitive to think of myrcene as a blue, but that's what they have determined. So they have highlighted really eight primary terpenes. They're talking about linalool, myrcene, pinene, humulene, caryophyllene, limonene, osamine, and terpinolene. Now, they have associated a smell or a fragrance with each of those colors. And you can look at the information as well. This is, of course, if, if you're colorblind or you know somebody who's colorblind, this could be a little difficult. Linalool, they're representing as being a floral scent. If you smell an earthy aroma in your cannabis, that's quite likely myrcene. Not a surprise that pinene is representing the pine aromas. Woody, that sense of woodiness that we get in some of our cannabis, that's coming from humulene. Caryophyllene, that pepper, that spicy, spicy is how they're referring to it on Leafly. Limonene, citrus, I guess that's really not a surprise. Anytime you're detecting any kind of citrus in your cannabis, there's likely some limonene in it. And then the sweetness, which we're finding out in a, a lot of things these days. We had some gummy bear strain in the other day, and that clearly had some osamine in it, which is sweet. And that's a red color. And then the orange is terpinolene, where we're going to get the fruity flavors and aromas in our cannabis. So find a shape, find a color, find your cannabis. Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I guess there's some, makes some sense to it. What's my initial reaction to this? Well, we've spoken about many times how the fact that the terpenes are what we need to be talking about, not whether it's an indica or a sativa. Are we looking for some relaxation? We already understand that we want to have some myrcene in it. So I'm going to take a look at a couple of different strains that I see here on Leafly just off the bat and give a sense of, of what we're identifying in that. So here's Girl Scout Cookie. So Girl Scout Cookie is represented in their diagram with significant colors of myrcene in THC. So THC is the predominance in Girl Scout Cookies. There's a lot of myrcene in it and significant, more significant amounts of myrcene than the other terpenes because it has elongated triangles, so a little higher THC as well. In addition to myrcene, there's going to be some caryophyllene, and there looks like some osamine. Let me just confirm the osamine piece, because that's the red one. Yeah, also some osamine in Girl Scout cookies, and that makes sense. So there you go. Their guide kind of works. And that's just looking at the visual representation of what they have. I should probably have two screens up so I can see the terpenes and what their floral representation and what their color representations are, because I haven't memorized that yet. But I think it's a good idea. I think this is a start and an opportunity for all of us to develop some new terminology. Thank you, Leafly, for all the effort that you put forward in it. And you really should take a look at the uh, at the link. I think you'll find it uh, pretty interesting. And this may be very well the way we determine what cannabis we're going to be smoking in the future. And we can thank Leafly.ca for the new Cannabis Guide. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. <laughs> This is the Cannabis Podcast. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, this is harvest time. And it has been a pretty exciting time. I mentioned, I think, way early on that I was going to plant my four cannabis plants. We did. We planted two black indicas and two Cali OG Kush. Those took up a significant space in our garden. In fact, we expanded our garden to cover off the space required for these plants. Started them in the house back in the early spring. They germinated without a problem. All the germination went well. Put them into the ground. They did extremely well. And it always seems every time we do this, this is only the second time we've done it, but every time the plant that seems to be the scrawniest as it goes into the ground ends up becoming the extremely dominant plant in the yard. And that was the case with one of our black indicas. It really took over its space. Uh, we, we trimmed it. We lollipopped it, trying to keep, 
you know, most of the growth heading to the top and get some nice big buds up there. And for the most part, that worked pretty well, but it was a really bushy plant. <laughs> and it got higher, perhaps, maybe because we were outdoors. We were entirely natural. We didn't add anything but water and love, I suppose. <laughs> love and care uh, towards it. We did, uh, we did use some fertilizer into the flowering stage for, I think, about the first couple of weeks of flowering, and then we stopped. Um, just wanted to give it a, a bit of a sense of getting some more dedication to it. But we like to really grow it without, not, not organic necessarily, but we're just not adding a lot of stuff. So therefore, I don't need to worry about taking a lot of stuff out. And I guess the other thing that happened over the course of the growing season was we did not get discouraged. You may remember a couple of episodes back, I did an interview with Anna Minton from Revelstoke, BC, who had the unfortunate incident of hosting a garden tour where she had some cannabis plants in their yard and an undercover RCMP officer came on site, discovered or decided that this was now a public space and seized their plants and took them away. When that happened, there was a lot of people that I'm associated with and that I know that made various comments about removing their plants uh, because they didn't feel confident about them not being any visible from a public space and they either gave them away or took them down. And I thought, ah, I was so sad to hear that. I didn't. Uh, I've always been a bit of a rebel and decided that our plants were situated where there was a couple of spots perhaps where you could see them from a public space, but you had to position yourself very, very particularly uh, at a particular time of day. And so we didn't worry about it. And as it turns out, it's a good thing we did because the harvest has gone exceptionally well. The indica plants started flowering probably in early September and much sooner than they did last year when we were just doing the sativas. So extremely pleased by that. Now, the main difference, I guess, from my perspective of what I've seen in the long history of growing cannabis, the two years we've been doing it, is that when you grow it outdoors and you don't feed it a whole bunch of other things, like a whole bunch of nutrients and stuff, you're not going to get the big, huge buds that you see in these indoor grows with the lights and all the nutrients and all of that stuff. But you know what? I'm pretty happy with the bud we got. It may not be the kind of bud you're going to put on the picture of High Times magazine, but it works. <laughs> I've already been through the process. As I say, we've harvested the indica. Last night was, unfortunately, the first frost of the year here in the Okanagan. And by frost, I mean it went down to minus 10, minus 10 Celsius that night. And as I looked to the garden this morning, it was very clear that the cannabis plants had been bruised. Everything was wilting. All the leaves were wilted on it. So it was time to harvest perhaps a little quicker. Although when I went out then and took a look at the biggest buds that were on the sativa plants, they were showing pretty well milky. And yet there was a, still a significant amount of amber that was showing up. So from the trichome perspective, the timing was right. The, the harvest was good. We did through that and it, and it was a, I did a piece by piece harvest as checking the, tr the trichomes on a daily basis. It was as I started to see more amber show up in certain branches that I would pick that branch and then put it up and dry all hanging up in our drying space, which turns out pretty good, about 55% humidity in that space. And it's worked out really well. So now on a daily basis, as those have been drying, I've been going upstairs, making a little check of each of the branches. And of course, waiting for that snap on any of the stalks as they are hanging. Once I had that significant branch snap, it was time to harvest that particular piece, take the buds off of that, Bring them on downstairs once more. Oh, oh, I just let out that my drying space is not downstairs. <laughs> That's all right. I'm not too worried about that. And then it goes into the curing process. Something again, a holdover from last year, did a lot of investigation about curing and got into a habit of getting the glass jars all ready and cleaned. And now I'm sitting with about 13 ounces in the curing stage from the Indica. There's still a bit more upstairs drying. That'll probably end up being about 
maybe maybe a pound. There might be another three ounces up there. So, and that's, you know, I'm pretty happy with that. So the curing process has started with that. And then today I did the first wet trim on the sativa plants. Those are now upstairs. And of course, because I had two different varieties this year, I had to make sure that I differentiated in the drying space between what was a sativa and what was an indica. Although, you know, what was the shape or what was the color? <laughs> It's still going to take me a little time to get used to that new leafly guide. So now I do have a half the drying space is still has some indica drying. And now a significant amount of sativa has been added to the other side of that drying space. So clearly differentiating between the two. And each day, as I already mentioned, I check for a little dryness. And if they are, they come down. I've been pulling down about an ounce a day is almost, I mean, an, a, a you know, wet weight, dry wet weight, because it's still going to change a little bit through the curing process. Uh, but I'm pretty happy with that and pretty happy the way things are starting to nug up in that curing process. And for those who haven't done it, the curing simply means that you're putting it into an airtight sealed jar. And then on a daily basis, you burp, give that jar a burp, open it up for a little bit, let the cannabis breathe a little bit, roll the, roll the jar so the buds don't stay in a stationary place and don't have a chance to generate some mold, but get some fresh air in there to keep the cannabis at a certain percentage. Right now, mine is sitting at uh, about 58%, I think, the last time I checked, which is good. And you continue that process for however long you want it to be until you are happy with the end result. Your buds have nicely nugged up. You got that beautiful aroma, and I am really happy with the aroma that's coming out this year. Last year on the sativas, which had originated just from some seeds that I found in some of the pot I had, I didn't actually purchase them. They were um, loners, shall we say. But through the process of curing and growing that, it never really did have an odor. There's a bit of a fruity taste um, or a rather fruity odor to that sativa. In fact, I still have some from last year. Let me give it a smell. Yeah, just a, just a small hint of, of fruitiness. Which, in my mind, then would now, I guess, mean that there's a little bit of osamine in there. So I have, again, got a number of sativas that are now into the drying process. They'll be about you know, 10 days before they head into the cure. And I got to keep trying to find more glass jars to build up all of this curing process and keep that going. And the other thing that we've done in this year's harvest was last year we kind of, uh, and I, I feel foolish to admit this, all of our trim, we we really didn't do anything with last year. I I, I processed a little bit into some uh, edibles. Uh, didn't really do much for us. My wife and I, edibles don't really do a whole lot for us. Maybe we'll discover some that do it eventually. But I really didn't do a whole bunch with the trim. This year, however, I decided to take a different approach. And I've concentrated on making some bubble hash. And I have been thoroughly intrigued, pleased with the process. Picked up some bags from bubblebagdo.co, and they have been great. It's a series of four different bags, all of varying tightness of holes, starting off with one that's probably about 220, then down to a 120, then a 73 micron, finishing up with a, a 25 micron to put the eventual out. And I was, I was pleased. I mean, let's be honest here. It's not gargantuan amounts of hashish, but it's hashish, and it's pretty darn good. I have quite enjoyed throwing some of that uh, wonderful bubble hash into my little pipe, pumping it up. And I remember the first time my wife uh, had a couple of tokes of it, she looked and said, oh, that's really good hash. <laughs> and I was really pleased to hear that because I agree with her. I think it is pretty good hash. So harvest time has occurred this time within the concept and confines of legalization. Last year, we were a little early, <laughs> although we didn't intend to be. But this year, uh, totally up and up, uh, pleased with our space. think we're going to use the same space again next year. Uh, no issues did we have whatsoever. And I think we've got some pretty fine cannabis that came out in the end. Now, there was an interesting story that I wanted to just touch on briefly <laughs> that happened. This is a story that it's actually focused here in the Okanagan. Once again, the link to this is uh, at CannabisPodcast.com if you want to check it out for yourself. 
a BC man finds a pencil instead of pot in his legally purchased pre-rolled joint. <laughs> I thought this was pretty humorous. <laughs> so it's a guy by the name of Chris Graham. He's a Kelowna resident. And he was having a hard time letting one of his recently purchased pre-rolls. It was on a Saturday night. He finally got it lit after several tries, and then he went to have a puff, and something was clearly not right, according to Chris, in his comment to Now Media. After examining the pre-roll's contents, Graham quickly realized the joint contained a large chunk of a pencil instead of actual pot. <laughs> now, if you there is a picture that is associated uh, to the article, and it looks to me like basically they've taken the end of the pencil, and that was the piece they stuck down that would have been pushing into the filter part of it. The joint was purchased at Hobo Cannabis in Kelowna for $6.92. It was made by licensed cannabis producer Terra Ascend under the company's Haven Street brand cannabis. Graham did get an exchange of his purchase at Hobo for a pre-rolled joint, uh, and the store's parent company, the Donnelly Group, provided the following statement to Now Media. All products in the Canadian adult use market is produced, packaged, and shipped by the licensed producer to the provincial distributor making this a matter for the licensed producer and BCRB. Cannabis stores are the end link in a long supply chain, said Harrison Stoker, VP of Brand and Culture with Donnelly Group. Federal and provincial regulations specifically prohibit retailers from quality-assuring products and state that everything must remain sealed in its original packaging. So Hobo had no idea that the pencil was in said pre-rolled. Hobo did issue the exchange to the customer and has initiated communications to the BCRB and the LP to get this matter sorted out. That kind of generated a few raised eyebrows <laughs> throughout the Okanagan when that story came out this last week. A pre-roll joint contained a little tiny piece of a pencil, and I suspect as they follow that back to the factory, someone's going to be losing their job on that one. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. Well, here we are just a few days away from a federal election here in Canada. October 21st, for those who are not aware, and for heaven's sakes, I hope you're all aware, October 21st is the date, is the Monday, and the current federal liberal government of Justin Trudeau, who introduced legalized cannabis to our country, is up for re-election, and they're hoping for another term. Based on the various debates and, and energies and things that have happened, that's not a, a sure thing by any stretch of the imagination. But as we have commented many times on the show, at least we do have legalized cannabis. Yes, there's still lots of things that need to be better. Yes, there's still lots of things that should be done differently. But we have legalized cannabis. We can go outside, sit in our backyard, light a joint, and not have to worry about anybody jumping through or the RSMP jumping over the fence and busting us. Unless, of course, we're growing it in a public garden tour, but that's an entirely different issue. So this is a story I wanted to touch on from theconversation.com. The headline is, A Campaign Promise Kept, Canada's Modestly Successful Cannabis Legalization. And my congrats to the author of this, Michael J. Armstrong, from theconversation.com. And I'm going to read a bit of it. And again, the link to it is back on CannabisPodcast.com. The anniversary of Canada's recreational cannabis legalization arrives October 17th, just days before the federal election. Legalization was a liberal campaign promise from the last election, so it's timely to review how it's worked out. Consumers evidently like legalization. Statistics Canada just reported that July's recreational sales hit $104 million dollars. Politicians apparently like it too. It's an election promise the Liberals kept and that no other party plans to repeal. And boy, am I glad to hear that. <laughs> that was my fear going into this federal election, was that the Conservatives were going to come along and repeal the legalization of cannabis, because I know they were not terribly in favor of it. But thankfully, that's not on anyone's plan. But back to the article. How well has it reduced black market cannabis as promised? Eh. And that's up for debate, I think. A government-funded study in 2018 estimated Canada's total cannabis consumption at roughly 926,000 kilograms annually, or some 77,000 kilograms monthly. Health Canada says that in June 2018, when only medical usage was legal, licensed producers sold 2,151 kilograms of dry cannabis 
and 4,052 liters of cannabis oil. That represents around 9% of national demand. In June 2019, by comparison, legal, medical, and recreational sales totaled 9.976 kilograms of dry and 9.614 liters of oil. That's about 26% of the market. So legal sales have roughly tripled, but illegal sales remain the majority. By contrast, StatsCan seems more optimistic. Its survey asks users whether they buy at least some cannabis legally. It's estimated that number is at about 47%, or 2.5 million Canadians, for the first quarter of 2019. That is up sharply from 23%, or 954,000 people, in 2018's first quarter. But unfortunately, those estimates aren't really plausible. The only people who could legally buy cannabis in March 2018 were Health Canada's 296,000-odd registered patients, and just 132,000 and odd of them did so. That implies StatsCan estimates are three to seven times too high. One reason legal sales haven't done better, as we talked about in fact the last episode, is a lack of retailers in some regions. Ding, ding, ding! <laughs> There's that bell again. British Columbia and Ontario, for example, were especially slow to open stores and still are. Product shortages have posed bigger problems. While there's ample oil, producers until recently hadn't processed enough dry products, and legal foods, drinks, vapes, and lotions aren't yet available. And I heard an interesting discussion on the state of the actual um, supply issue. Because people are saying, how can there be a supply issue when we're getting cannabis that was packaged back in the fall of 2018? Clearly, it's been around for a while, so there can't be any shortages. The article goes on to say, those shortages are predictable side effects of the government's legalization strategy. It shows a regulated pharmaceutical approach rather than the more hands-off approach many U.S. states have used. That hands-off approach has several drawbacks, however. Ex-black market producers don't always prioritize consumer safety. Some reportedly fudge their product lab tests. Furthermore, minimal government oversight is worrisome to social conservatives. Almost 80% of California cities banned state-licensed cannabis shops. But the pharmaceutical approach has its own drawbacks. Rigorous standards prevent existing grow ops from going legit. Instead, they remain illegal and undercut legal producers' prices. And that one paragraph explains a whole lot of the problem that there is in Canada right now with the legalization of cannabis. <laughs> if the government had simply allowed in British Columbia all of the fabulous growers we had who are still at it, but they're producing for the black market, not for the legal market, if they could have simply turned a switch and started producing for the legal market, the introduction of cannabis in our country would have gone a whole lot differently. Uh, we can only hope. We can only wish that things will get to that stage. So once again, I urge you to vote. It doesn't really matter who you vote for, but get out there and vote this year. From studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And before I get to the last piece today, I just felt I needed a little inspiration with a little bubble hash. Mmm. I love the taste of that. Mmm. And wham, I love the effect of that. Mmm. Very, very nice. Let me leave you today with a story of something that happened to me over this last week, where I finally saw a little stigma go away. I was entered in a local golf tournament club championship. I... In fact, I've never entered such a tournament before, despite the fact that I'm reasonably old. I had never done such a thing before, but this year it was perfect. Club that I played at for the last few years I'm comfortable with, and it was the club championship. There were, you know, not a ton of us, but a number of members of the club that were entered into this. It was an 18-hole tournament. My only hesitation in going into the tournament is when I golf this course, I typically smoke a lot of joints as I'm heading around that course. Makes my golf far more enjoyable. Makes my enjoyment of it much, much better. So I was worried about whether I was going to have the opportunity over the course of this tournament to do that same thing, not knowing who I was going to be paired up with. One of the people that I saw I was paired up with was a fellow by the name of Ken. He's a retired gentleman. He's been probably retired for 20 years. He's been a longtime member of the course. Really a nice guy. He's a good golfer. 
but I was kind of sure that he probably didn't participate in cannabis. And then I met the third partner in our threesome that was going around for the 18 holes. He's a gentleman by the name of Kim. And as Kim and I became acquainted and I asked how often he came to the golf course, he's, oh, you know, three or four times a week and I like to smoke a doobie every once in a while. And I turned to him and my eyes lit up and I said, you don't know how happy I am to hear that because I do exactly the same thing. And needless to say, he was equally pleased to hear that I was a toker just like he was. And I think it was hole number three where I stepped off to the side a little bit. Ken was up on the tee box. I pulled out a joint, lit it up. And as I'm puffing away, Ken looks down at me and said, oh, I, I didn't know you were a smoker. I said, well, I, I don't smoke cigarettes, Ken. Uh, this is cannabis. And surprisingly, his response was, oh, go, oh good for you. I, I still don't quite understand what he meant by good for you, but <laughs> but I was pleased that he wasn't you know, terribly offended. And that's what I mean about finally I saw a situation where the stigma could still be applied, but but it wasn't. And so over the next 15 holes after that one, I think about every third hole, either Kim or I pulled out a joint and we proceeded to <laughs> devour that joint while waiting at the tee box for our turn to go. And boy, did it ever make the tournament fun. It perhaps didn't make the golf any better. In fact, we were joking with Ken that, you no, know, if suddenly our golf incredibly improved, he would need to start smoking cannabis to improve his golf. It didn't turn out that way. I... <laughs> Whether it was because of the tournament jitters, probably the tournament jitters, that's what I'm writing it off to, but I had one of my worst games of the year, the highest score I had achieved on any nine-hole section. <laughs> but you know what? They did it with a handicap. And because of the way the handicap was determined for that course on that particular day, because I played so badly, it helped me. And I ended up taking second place for the men. <laughs> So it just goes to show you, you too can get stoned on the golf course and win a golf tournament, maybe not first place, but there was nothing wrong with second place. Gave me 50 bucks and, and a case of cider. <laughs> it was a fun day nonetheless, and I was really pleased to be able to do it and, and enjoy the cannabis like I usually did without any hassle from anyone else. I think we're going to dig up another cultivar for some cultivar corner next week. If you have any suggestions or thoughts on that, send them to me at info at cannabispodcast.com. Let me give a shout out to Kylie, who contacted me through that, and also another shout out to Patrick. Patrick often comes into the store where I'm a bud tender and makes a comment about listening to the podcast. I appreciate you being a listener, Patrick. I've known him for many, many years. Appreciate that you're listening and, and that you're having some fun and getting some good information. And that about wraps it up for episode 30 of the Cannabis Podcast from the cannabis-infused studio. High above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Podcast.